Okay, I'm gonna turn this all the way down so I can you know, put it on without you know, causing a lot of uh, noises on the, in the recording itself. Just have to make sure I don't walk away with this. <laughs> and the campus police will try to find me with stolen property. I don't have anything to hook up to because I wear T-shirts. I don't think they expect you know, the instructors to wear T-shirts. <clears throat> All right. So, do you think it's picking up my voice or not? Doesn't look like doesn't look that way, does it? No. How about now? No. The other one is picking up my voice because when I speak, you can see the top bar, you know, fluctuates. But the one in the bottom doesn't seem to fluctuate as much. But I can still see this thing is picking it up. It's just, you know, for whatever reason, it's not getting onto the computer. Okay, fine. We'll just uh, use the usual way of doing things. I will ask around and see if I can get this problem fixed. Okay, so I'm going to turn this off. And just use the usual microphone. Is it okay? I mean, is the usual microphone sufficient? You know, it does change the volume depending on where I am, you know, here, but it, it will still be audible, hopefully, most of the time. Okay. All right, so I'm not going to you know, fuss with this too much anymore, and we'll go ahead and focus on the processor architecture, but before we do that, are there any questions about the homework assignment? Yes? Uh, the assignment said it was only to use those components, but yes. I had to use a couple of constants. That's okay, right? Constants? Yeah, just so they Inside the ROM, you can use constants, but not outside. You don't need any constants outside of the ROM. But you need to have like a one coming in so it will uh, use the uh, register, correct? A one coming in. You're right. Yep, yep. You need a one over there. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions? Okay, so one hint is the output of the ROM does not need to only go to the LED. It can go to other components as well. Okay, so that's a big clue of how to do the, uh, how to reset, you know, the whole thing. So I start from zero again. Okay, so I hope you guys would kind of get that clue because it's kind of important to kind of figure out the solution by yourselves or as, as much as possible. That's the, that's, that's the learning experience. That's how we learn how to do this type of thing uh, in this class. All right, so this is a picture of the processor, pretty much done, and you can use this to help inspire your music box um, homework assignment, okay? You know, this is already published, um, and I, I have no attempt to hide this particular design. So for those of you who want to take a look at this one and go like, well, can I borrow anything from this particular design? You can go ahead and study it and borrow designs from this particular thing, which is an entire processor. So what we'll do today is we'll start to introduce components of this entire design, and we'll talk about the various components by themselves and then we'll focus on you know, how, do they, how they're connected and how they function as a whole. In other words, what we are doing now is we are piece by piece, we're trying to study and, and analyze the components inside a processor and figure out, okay, how do they work together? Are there any questions at this point about you know, where we are, you know, kind of in a general roadmap, you know, how this relates to other things that we have talked about so far? Okay, no questions? All right, so if there are no questions, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and start up um, LogiSim, okay, and then we'll just take a look in LogiSim of the various components that we'll be using. Um, so we'll go ahead and start up LogiSim. <clears throat> Are you guys getting somewhat familiarized with uh, LogiSim? You can get the tools and, okay, all right, very good. All right, so we'll look under wiring. You know, most of these things we have, I have explained already. 
uh, splitter is extremely helpful. Okay, it's a utility by itself. It's not very useful, but it's a very good utility. So you can basically look up. You, know, you can hook up wires into bundles, so you don't have to wire. You don't have to route like twenty gazillion wires. You know, on your screen all at the same time. Pins we have used already. Probes we're not going to use those too much here in this class. Uh, clock is useful. Okay, the music box is driven by a clock. Constants we have used already. Power ground transistors, those are all low level devices where we're not going to use too much in this class. So, wiring, you know, not too much more to talk about. In terms of gates, uh, we have the usual gates, and for the most part, we are done with gates as well, with only one that we are going to talk about, which is a controlled buffer. Okay? So, we'll take a look at a controlled buffer and basically go, okay, so what is it going to do? So with a control buffer, if I just kind of magnify, we can now see one end is the input, this is the output, okay? So what is so special about it is the third connection, okay? The third connection, which is what I have highlighted here on the projector, is very important because this is the control of whether the output should be driven or not, okay? In other words, yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, I, I was just going to ask you to elaborate on that driven. It's basically a clutch, okay? So on one side, you have the input. So the input can do you know, whatever it wants. Without the quote-unquote clutch, okay, the input is directly hooked up to the output. That's what a buffer does, okay? So a buffer you know, is an electrical or electronic device where you can use one weak input to specify you know, a one or a zero, but the output has a lot more uh, capability of driving multiple outputs or driving you know, multiple components. That's what a buffer does. But this is not just a buffer, it is a controlled buffer. You can see the name is a controlled buffer, which means the output can be turned off, okay? So that it is just, it, it doesn't do anything. It, it's, it does not specify the actual output. So what I'll do is I'm gonna give you an example of how this works, okay? So what I'll do is I will hook up some pins, okay? So here's an input pin, to the input, gets an input pin to the control gate here. And what I'll do is I'm gonna hook up an output pin over here. So we can just kind of observe, you know, what happens when we hook up these various pins and change their state accordingly. Okay, there we go. And then we'll do something like this. It's in simulation mode, okay? In simulation mode, what do you think is, uh, what do you think it means when the output pin has a cross in it? is in tri-state, okay? Nobody is, is, is specifying the state of the output. The blue wire is basically saying, well, nobody is you know, specifying the value here, okay? Well, in reality, if you put a voltmeter on a particular wire on the motherboard, there's no su such thing as there's no signal, okay? It's always there's some voltage there. So the question now is what is the voltage when nobody is specifying it? Well, it depends on the temperature, depends on the face of the moon, depends on <laughs> your proximity to the computer. It's noise, okay? It's basically noise on the wire, okay? Because every wire, you know, regardless of how short it is, it is an antenna, okay? You know, any type of you know, change in magnetic field will induce current, and you know, current will induce voltage you know, on that wire. Okay? But it's not something that is specified. Nobody is actually saying, oh, this should be a one or this should be a zero. Is that okay so far? Okay? For those of you who drive a manual transmission, this is equivalent. Having a zero going into the control line is the same thing as pressing on the clutch completely. So you're disengaging the transmission from the engine. You know, those two components are not you know, connected at this point. Are we doing okay so far with that? Okay. Or if you drive an automatic transmission, put it into neutral. This is the same thing as putting it into neutral. So you can wrap the engine all you want on this side. Nothing is gonna happen on the other side because it, they're not hooked up. Are we doing okay so far with that analogy, okay? So the control signal is your shifter, okay? So what if I shift it and you know, put it into D for automatic transmission or put it into first? Then suddenly, they're connected. Okay, 
This is the same thing as releasing the clutch pedal on the manual transmission or putting your car into D or R. Okay, so now the engine is connected to the drive shaft. So if I change this one, if I wrap up the engine, guess what? The wheel will spin. Like so. Okay? But I can also, at any time, okay, these two signals are completely independent. I can turn this off and the output goes back into tri-state, which means nobody is actually specifying the signal or the voltage of that line. Are we doing okay so far with this concept? Okay. Can anyone imagine why this would be a useful feature? Yep. I wanted to make, I wanted to ask you like this a couple times when I was working on the, some of the, uh, the adders. Okay. Because when you're trying to make something instead of like a not and gate or something, when you have a, um, as soon as you have this, you can have it. So um, when you have, I had it with the, the and gate, I kept one just instead of having a mess of wires, if I just had one that would branch off and turn another one off. Well, it's not turning it off. It's basically not driving or not specifying the output which is not the same thing as turning it off. So with, with the adder and the subtractor, you do not need this construct. What you do need, when you do need this construct is when you deal with uh, RAM, R-A-M, you know, with uh, read, uh, read, uh, random access memory. Because when you have read, random access memory, remember the, the data bus? Who's driving the data bus? CPU. Well, it depends, right? If you're writing to RAM, then the CPU, CPU will drive the data bus. But when you're reading from RAM, the RAM chip itself is driving the data bus. Okay? But you don't want both components to be driving the bus at the same time because that ends up with a what? Bus fight. It ends up with a bus fight. Okay? I'm glad you guys remember that. Okay? Because that really is a technical term. Okay? So how do you control it so that you, know, you don't have both components you're driving the bus? This is one of the mechanisms. Okay? Where you can basically say if it's a read operation, then only the RAM is driving the bus and the CPU stops you know, talking on the data bus. Okay? So internal to the CPU, there's a control mechanism like this. Later on, we'll see it in the overall design. But I, right now, I just wanted to show you the component itself and just you know, show you how the input into the component changes the output. Is that okay so far? Now, if I just want to, if I really want to illustrate that particular point, I can, I can make it very, you know, pretty easy. I can, what I can do is I can replicate this part, okay, like so. So now I have two mechanisms like that, and I will hook up the output of both of them into the same wire, okay? So now, do we have a bus fight at this point? If you look at the blue wire as the bus, who's driving it? Nobody. Okay? If it's blue, it is in tri-state mode, which means nobody is actually driving the bus. Okay? Which in reality would not be a good thing because if the bus is not being driven, <laughs> hopefully it's stationary. Okay? Okay, now I can say, oh, I want you to drive the bus. Okay? And change the state of this signal. Do we have a bus fight? No. Because only one person is driving the bus, right? If I turn on the other one, now we have two people trying to drive the bus, and they're trying to steer the bus in different directions, okay? One is trying to steer the bus to one, the other one's trying to drive the bus to zero, and now we have a bus fight, which is not a good thing. Because what happens in a bus fight, in reality, in terms of physics, is there will be a really huge amount of current coming from this end directly into this wire, through this wire into the other buffer. And that's what happens physically when you have a bus fight, is you have one component sourcing or you know, uh, producing the current, and the other one is sinking the current. Okay? And that always ends up with you know, something heating up, and it depends on whether the chip can drive more, then it can sink to determine who's going to die first. Okay? Uh, with most components, the one that is sinking can sink more current without dying. So usually, in this case, it will be the top buffer that is going to die first. Because you know, most chips cannot source as much current as they can sink. All right. Are there any questions about this bus, uh, this picture? This picture of a bus. 
Okay, if I want to you know, end the bus fight, I just have to turn off one of the two drivers. Then we don't have a bus fight anymore. Is that okay? Now one person is still driving the bus. The bottom one is still driving the bus. Okay, it's specifying a value of zero. If I turn that one off too, then nobody is actually driving the bus. So whatever you're measuring, if you put an oscilloscope onto that wire, onto the blue wire, you will still see some signals you know, flipping around like this, but that's only because of interference, okay? It's basically an antenna picking up your know, interference from other components of the circuit board, or if you put a cell phone next to it and somebody call you on the cell phone, well, that will put a big buzz onto the components too, okay? But nonetheless, it is not your own circuit trying to specify what voltage you know, that line should have. Are we doing okay so far with this picture? Is that okay? All right, if this is okay, we'll move on to talk about another component that is really helpful, but it's not a, <coughs> excuse me, thank you. But it's not a gate, okay? So in this case, it is a plexer, okay? So plexers are very useful uh, tools. We have seen one already, um, so hopefully we can uh, go ahead and understand the other one. Um, we have talked about a um, decoder already. So what we'll do today, we'll talk about a multiplexer and also a demultiplexer, okay? When you look at the names, what do you think a demultiplexer, how does it relate to a multiplexer? It does the opposite thing. It does the opposite, right? It does the opposite of a multiplexer, okay? So that's why it's called a demultiplexer. There are many terms in computer science that are kind of like this, uh, like what is a modem, by the way? I know it's, it sounds completely unrelated to what we are talking about, but what is modem? And many of you are way too young to know what a modem is, but some of us remember those days, okay? What is a modem? Well, you, you have cable modem, right? I mean, we still have cable modems if you have Comcast. What is a modem? What, what is, a, is, a, a, is an abbreviation of two words. Which two words are we talking about? Modulator, demodulator, okay? That's the actual name of a modem, okay? So a, a multiplexer is like this, okay? It has input zero, input one, this is the uh, enable pin, okay? This is the selection pin, and this is the output. Just want to be sure this is, this is the enable pin because there's a dot next to it, okay? So what do you think this thing is going to do? It has two input and one output. But it's not an OR gate. It's not an AND gate, okay? What is special about an OR gate and an AND gate is the output is directly determined by the combination of the inputs, right? But this one, that's not the case, okay? The output is not a function of the input, of the input pins individually. What do you think it, it, it should? What do you think is a good analogy of this one? How many people play with uh, model trains? Or have seen people playing with model trains? Okay. So with model trains or with, or with a regular train track, okay, how do you deal with the situation that you have two rails coming in to the station, but there's only one rail into the, onto the platform? What do you do? Track, track switching, right? That's what it is. Okay but it only deals with two inputs and one output, okay? Because a train track is bi-directional, right? Because you, know, you can have trains coming in through the track or you can have trains going out through the track. With electrical devices, this is only in one direction. So in this case, you have two input tracks and one output track and the switcher is determined by this pin here. This one is just for enabling it, which is a, it's the same thing. It does the same thing as a buffer. In other words, you can use it to control whether the output is driving or not. So if you don't want that feature, you can say, you know, that we will we'll never disable the output. So the output is always driven. So we can also turn this off too. So you can see that pin, well, I, I, I messed up. <coughs> it's the other one. So the only one that's remaining now is the one that is controlling which side of the track we are connecting. Are we kind of doing okay with this one? So let's go ahead and play with this a little bit. So same thing, we go to wiring. Now that we have buttons, you can play with buttons too, but this will serve just as well. T1, 
two input pins. Actually, we need one more to control. Okay, which track we are talking about, and then we have one output pin mm -hmm. on this side, and we'll just go ahead and play with this a little bit. There we go. And put it into simulation mode. Put this one as a zero. This one as a one. Okay. Now that you know the the the, the selection pin is not specified. It doesn't know which one to connect to the output. That's why it is not specified. Okay, it is. It actually has a state, but we don't know which one it is, and that's why you see a cross. What was that? <coughs> that second pin we removed wasn't it also the thing? That's the enable pin, which serves the same purpose as this pin here. In other words, you can specify the output to be not driven even after you select a track. <coughs> so you you can build in a component like this into a multiplexer, basically. But since I just want to focus on the function of a multiplexer, I take that you know, equation, I take that part out of it for now. So okay. the multiplexer is basically just a control buffer with multiple inputs? It's correct. It is a selector, basically. It's a selector with multiple inputs and only one output. Okay. So right now, I'm selecting from channel zero. So this zero is now matched with this pin here, because when you when you hover over this pin, it says it'll input zero. Now, what makes this more fun is when you have multiple um, tracks, because you know the input can be multiple can have deal with can deal with multiple inputs. So if I look at this one, I can say data bits. We can increase it to four. Okay. Now that would also mess up the thing because now we need four wires going to input zero and four wires going to input one. But you can also change the number of select bits. So now I change that too, and the picture is really, really messed up. So we will just go ahead and fix this one. Okay. We'll get rid of all the unnecessary pins. Okay. And get rid of this one too. Okay, well, I didn't have to get rid of everything, but I just want to start from scratch here. All right, so I'm going to get rid of these two wires too. So let's get rid of this one, get rid of this one. All right, so now we have changed the design just a little bit so that we have two selection bits. With two bits, how many combinations do we get? Four. How many unique combinations of zeros and ones do we get? Four. Four, Four right? So we have zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. So that means with two input bits, I can now select one out of four possible inputs. Is that making any sense? Okay. But on top of that, I'm also changing the input, so the input and the output, so it's not dealing with one bit at a time. The input now has four data bits. In other words, it's kind of the same thing as a train that has four wheels, okay, four wheels wide. Okay, so the, each track, you know, has four, you know, individual, how do you call those things? Yeah. Rails, okay. <clears throat> okay. All right, so let's go ahead and see if we can make some sense out of this one. So we will go ahead and specify inputs again, but this time I don't want the input pin to be one bit only, because I need this, the width of the input to match the width of the multiplexer itself. And now that we have selected four, we can replicate it four times replicated three times so we can get four copies. First one goes here, second one goes here, third one goes here, and the last one goes here. Okay. I can mess around with these values later on, but right now I just you know I just want to finish the picture. The input of this now has two bits, okay? Because I can select one of four inputs and I will need two bits to do that. So my input pin to go into the selection here will now require two data bits. So these two data bits will go into this wire here, okay? And I don't really need the twice stay, so we'll just go ahead and turn that off, okay? So we don't need to deal with that, so it won't float basically. 
And then the output of the multiplexer has to have the same width as the input because it's the same train that is coming in that is going out of the device. So you will need the same number of rails per track in order to get this done. So when we specify the output pin, we'll also have to say, oh, this now needs four pins or four bits wide. So it would match the same thing as the other one. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and play with this one a little bit. Okay, go into simulation mode. And I don't want to use, you know, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on. So we'll randomly pick some values over here that are not the usual, you know, numbers that we expect, you know, for stuff like that, okay? So I'm just randomly picking some values here. What do you think is going to be the output if I make uh, this one 0, 1, make the input pin 0, 1? It'll be one zero one zero exactly <coughs> because when you hover over this one, this is input one, this is input two, this is input three. When you look at the binary representation of zero, one, two, and three, that is basically how what these two pins are controlled, or, or these two bits of one single pin is controlled. So let's go ahead and confirm that theory. If I change the selection bit, which are these two, to zero one the output is 1010 zero, zero, because it's picking the input from here. If I change it to 11, one, one, what would be the output? 1011. One, 1011, one. One, one, one. exactly. There you go. Are there any questions about this picture or what a multiplexer does? So it's just reading from one of the inputs and spinning it out to the output? It's, it has multiple inputs. You have a selector and you select one and only one input to become the actual output. That's basically what a multiplexer does. Okay. So the name multiplexer makes it sound a lot more complicated than it really is, right? Because it's just a switch with multiple input and only one output. Okay, so given what you know about this picture, what do you think a D multiplexer is going to do? Split into from one to four or however many. One input and multiple output, right? Exactly. That is exactly what a D multiplexer do. Okay. So D multiplexer has one single input, and you can feed it to one of the four possible outputs. So let's go ahead and pick one up, and you know, just play with it, right? So pick up a D multiplexer, okay? And this time we'll we'll make a <coughs> we'll take out the enable pin so that we don't have to deal with that one. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead and change the number of selection bits. So we'll make the selection bits two, but instead of using the data bits being one, we'll make three this time, okay, just to throw some varieties into this. So we can see that with two input bits, we have four outputs. If you change this to three, what do you think would be the number of outputs? Eight, exactly, because two to the power of three is eight, okay? So the number of outputs is the exponent of two uh, relative to the number of selection bits. Yep. So the, <coughs> so the maximum amount of outputs can be five only. Correct. So when we do five bits, two to the fifth power, right? Yep. So that would be two, uh, that would be 32, right? So now that, okay, that's a very good question. Seems like we have a pretty, you know, we have a limitation here, right? So what if you need more than uh, five selection bits? What if whatever you're doing has like 10 selection bits? Change, what do you do? Change uh, another one. You have a hierarchy, right? So each output out of one demultiplexer would go into one, the second level demultiplexer. So by hierarchically you're structuring your demultiplexers, in theory, you can handle as many bits as you need. Is that okay? Now, in practice, you know, there's a certain limitation because every time you go through a, mul a multiplexer or a demultiplexer, there's a delay. Okay, you know, it takes you know time to um, to go from the input to the output. So when you have introduced too much delay in the system, sometimes you know, things just don't work or not efficiently anymore. So there's a certain limitation of what you can do with that theory. Okay, so just to finish this demonstration, we'll go ahead and pick out one input here because with the demultiplexer you have one input and multiple outputs. And we have to change the data bits to fit this one here. And then we have multiple outputs. And 
we'll go ahead and fix the data bits to three. Then we can go ahead and replicate this design, this, these pins. Why are the data bits three and not four again? Hmm? Why are the data bits three and not four again? I just, you know, because I chose to have two selection bits that will make, that will have four outputs, but since I changed the, since I selected the three data bits, that's why it's only three bits wide. Okay, so we'll hook up these two, this one over here. I may have an issue. Here we go. Doesn't like it, does it? <laughs> Fine. <coughs> okay, so now we have one input, four outputs, and I will also need another input pin to control the selection bit. I only need two in this case to go into the selection control here. All right. All right, so let's, yep, go ahead. Row sheet. Row sheet, thank you. I keep forgetting this. Forgot uh, yesterday with my 360 class. There we go. Thank you. All right, so now let's go ahead and change this input here. So we'll go into simulation mode and change this to, let's say, 110, okay? So you can see that only one output you know, has the actual output from the input, okay? Now, if I change this zero, zero to, let's say, one, zero, which output do you think will change to one, one, zero? The third one. The third one, exactly, yep. Now, I can also change that the other ones will no longer be driven. So if I select the demultiplexer, I can say this able output is not zero, it is now floating, okay? So we, when we go into simulation mode, it will behave differently because you know in this case uh, it doesn't quite do that. It's because I need another control pin. So we make a control pin here. Tri-state. There we go. So if you select tri-state, um, basically the other three outputs other than the one that we have selected is no longer driven, which is probably a better thing to do. Okay? But you have the option, okay? Sometimes you know it makes more sense not to drive the ones that are not being selected. Other times you can drive them, except they'll be driven to zeros. So you have that option when you play with the evil complexity. Yep. When would you need that? When would you need that? When you have multiple things. Remember the uh, multiple RAM chips? That's when you need it because you only need one of the multiple RAM chips to be selected, so the other ones can all get zeros, except for the one that you want to select. All right, are there any questions about what a demultiplexer does? No questions about that? Okay. <clears throat> and a decoder is basically a special version of a demultiplexer, where the input is Kind of determined. Okay, so I think we have done the decoder already. So let's let's play with the decoder. See if you guys remember what the decoder is going to do. So with this particular decoder, we'll do the same thing. This able output is floating. Um, we don't have an input enabled, so we take we just make it easier this way. Um, and then we'll just hook up the input pin to here, and then we'll hook up two output pins. Do I hope you guys still remember? this particular device because we have talked about this device already. There you go. All right. So it is the same thing as a demultiplexer with a constant of one as the input. Okay. So a decoder is exactly the same thing as, the, as a demultiplexer except the, one, the input is a constant one. Because now all you can do is really just to use the selection bit to control which output has a one. Okay. Now you can also do other things too. Okay. If you want to, you can change the number of selection bits to two, and we'll go ahead and change this one to also two bits. 
and obviously we'll have to do something about our output pins take out some wires so that you can rearrange things a little bit here this kind of simulation software you know was not available oh okay there are too many I just want to get rid of the wire right there we go one more doesn't line up. <laughs> Fine. Well, I used to do board layout, like PCB board layout, and that's a lot worse than this. There we go. There we go. Okay. So, if I make this a one zero, the third pin is going to be a one, and everything else is going to be a zero. Oh, put it into simulation mode first. Put a one here. Okay. So, do you guys see how this is really the same thing as a demultiplexer, but with a constant of one as the input? Yep. Go ahead. Can you also turn on the, the other ones are not driven? Yes, you can because um, you can select the decoder and change. Uh, try state to yes and disable output to floating. Same thing as a demultiplexer. So in some cases this makes more sense, you know, when a pin is not selected, you don't drive the other pins, uh, you don't drive that particular pin, but other times, you know, putting a default of zero makes sense as well. So it all depends on the application. And they make uh, chips, you know, that can do either one, okay? Are there any questions about this? Yep. What does it mean to turn disabled output floating? That means you know the ones that are disabled because when you specify this these two pins, you are selecting which pin is quote unquote enabled, which means out of the four, three would now be dis would three would be disabled. But when the quote when the pin is quote unquote disabled, you have a choice of either not driving the pin or driving to zero. Now sometimes it makes more sense not to drive it so that other devices can drive that pin, but sometimes you know, if this is the only input into that particular input pin, it makes more sense to make a default of zero. So it all depends on you know, where these pins are actually connected on the other side. Okay, is that kind of answering the question a little bit, sort of? Okay. All right, so we are pretty much done with the you know, plexers now. Um, then we have the usual arithmetic stuff. Okay, the arithmetic stuff includes all of these, you know, calculation units. Um, these are basically components that you will find in an ALU or arithmetic logic unit. In your current homework assignment, the music box, you're going to make use of an atom. Okay, but you can probably imagine what the other ones would do. Okay, the one would do a subtraction, the subtractor. Uh, the multiplier would do multiplication. The negator would actually find the negative representation of a number in binary, okay? We haven't talked about that yet, but by the time we get to talk about it, then it would be useful. A comparator is interesting because you can probably guess what it does, right? It compares numbers. But inside a processor, we don't have a dedicated comparator. Instead, we just have subtractors. But we use a subtractor to determine which number is bigger which, and which number is smaller. By the time we get to that part, I'll explain how, it's, how it works, okay? But most processors do not have a comparator as a, as a hardware component. It just uses a subtractor to do the job of comparing, okay? Um, and then we have you know, some really useful ones too, okay? A shifter is useful, okay? Because it cannot, shifting to the left is easy to do because you can just add a number to itself to double, okay? That's shifting to the left. Shifting to the right cannot be done easily. And that's why that's, you know, there's a special hardware to do bit shifting to the right. Does everybody understand what I mean by shifting to the left can be done by a single addition? If you look at your C code, okay, hopefully you still remember and see how to do bit shifting. Okay. So assuming x is an integer, shifting to the left by one bit 
is really the same thing as x plus x. Or x times 2. Is that making any sense? Okay, doubling a value will basically be putting an extra zero, padding a zero to the least significant bit, and shift all the other bits to the left hand side. So that's why, you know, this in terms of shifting, you usually only need a right shifter, but not a left shifter, because a left shifting can be done by addition. All right, are there any questions about uh, arithmetic operators? The other ones we're not going to use, like a bit finder, you know, we're not going to use it. Uh, we talked about memory already, particularly RAM and ROM, and also register. Okay, you, do you guys still remember register that you're going to have to use in your music box? Okay, and also ROM, you know, that al that's also something you need to use in your music box. Um, that's it. Those are all the basic components that we need to use when you, we are dealing with the processor. Are there any questions at this point? No questions at this point. So what we'll do next is we'll focus on one of the components inside the processor, and we'll just take a look at the implementation of that component, okay? The Music Box homework assignment is related to the microcode engine of your processor. So we'll defer the discussion of that one until your homework assignment is due. Instead, what we'll do is we'll now focus on the ALU, the Arithmetic and Logic Unit, okay? So we'll go ahead and take a look at the ALU, which is, by the way, let me just point out where the design is. The ALU is this component over here, okay? When you open up the entire you know, design, this is the ALU. When you double click on it, it will show you the actual details of the ALU. But what I'll do today is I'm going to design the ALU on the fly using LogiSim as I explain the components and how they connect, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and do it the right way and just add a circuit. We'll call this the ALU, okay? So um, to the least number of things an ALU should be able to do, if you look under arithmetic, the first one is gonna be an adder. The second one is a subtractor. And we also need a bit shifter, okay? So a right shift operation is actually necessary in most cases. <coughs> so we'll use a, a shifter as well. Okay, the other thing we have to do now is to say, okay, uh, regardless of the operation, and by the way, this shifter, we wanted to do a right shift instead of a left shift. But when you look at all these options here, do you know the differences between all of these options other than the left and the right? In other words, we have a logical right shift, but we also have an arithmetic right shift. How are they different? It's pretty hard to explain this one without knowing how negative, negative numbers are represented. Okay, So for now, we are just going to say logical shift, which means we'll pad the leftmost digit, the most significant bit, with a zero when we shift the rest of the bits to the right hand side. Is that okay? Does, do you guys what I mean by that? Okay, let's say we're dealing with four bits, okay? So this, we, we have a four bit number, let's say 1101, okay? It's a four bit number. If you shift this to the right hand side by one bit, the question is, what is gonna be the, the final product? What do you think? Well, it depends on whether this is a logical shift or a arithmetic shift. If this is a logical shift, okay, so the logical shift is going to give you the result of adding a zero to the most significant bit and moving everything else to the right hand side by one position. So you end up with zero, one, one, zero in the case of logical shift. What about arithmetic shift? Arithmetic shift is going to preserve the sign of the number. And this is actually represented, can be used to represent a negative number. So the end result has to be negative as well. When you want to preserve the sign of a number, you have to preserve the most significant bit. In other words, instead of blindly shifting in a zero to replace the most significant bit, we are replicating what is already here. So the end result of an arithmetic shift is going to be one, 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 zero instead of zero, one, one, zero. 
That's the difference between a logical shift, which is blindly shifting in a zero, as opposed to a rhythmic shift, which is replicating the original most significant bit. Okay. We'll get to this part again. Okay. So if you don't quite understand why we need to do a rhythmic arithmetic shift, we can deal with that later. Okay. It's not a big concern at this point. So we'll go ahead and just select a, rit a logical right shift at this time. Okay. Um, bitwise operations can be useful as well, but I'm not going to put those in. Okay. In other words, you know, bitwise and bitwise or, you know, those things can be done using our usual uh, gates here. Okay. So you can specify an AND gate, except, you know, it has multiple data bits. Instead of one, you can make it so that it fits like 8 bit, 32 bit, and so on. But I'm not going to do that. Okay. I'll just keep the design simple at this point. Okay. So we have three um, possible operations. First one is addition, second one is uh, subtraction, third one is a shift operation. So how do we specify the numbers that we are working with here? So assuming at this point, let's just assume that we don't care about the carry in and the carry out. Okay? So the carry in is going to be a zero all the time, the borrow in is going to be a zero all the time, carry out and borrow out, we don't really need to connect to anything. Okay, so let's deal with that first. Okay, we'll we'll fix those particular constants and say we don't really need those. So we'll put a zero as the input of carry of the adder, and then we'll do the same thing with a subtractor. And then the output, we don't really need to hook it up to anything at this point because I just need to know what is the sum or the difference between two numbers. Okay. So the ALU is interesting in many ways because the ALU has the same input connected to all three calculations. Or there are the one implementation can do it this way. So now we have, okay, how many bits do we want to deal with at a time? You guys can choose. It's dealing with eight bits at a time. You want to deal with four bits, whatever. Eight bit is okay. Okay. So we'll deal with eight bits. So we now have to make sure that you know, it's eight bit here, eight bit here, and also eight bit here. Okay. So now we can now specify the first operand to the addition, subtraction, and also the shifting. This one needs to have eight data bits as well. Like so. need to move everything a little bit to the other side so we have enough room. This is the first operand. We also need the second operand, which is also a bit wide. So now we have two operands, which is okay. Okay. So where do we hook up the first one to? <coughs> the adder, the subtractor, and the shift operation. What about the second number? It becomes the second operand of the adder the subtractor, and also the bit shift operation. Well, that one deal doesn't, it doesn't need eight bits because it only, it can only shift up to eight bits. So that's why we have a problem with this one here, which is not too difficult to fix. Okay, how do we deal with this? A splitter, right? Because we only need the least significant three bits. So with a shifter, we'll put it here, and we'll make it phase. Yeah, that would do it. We'll have an input of exactly eight bits, and we only need the first three. So bit zero to two will go into here. Now everything is good. I'm just tossing away the other bits away because it wouldn't matter anyway. All right. So this means you know whenever I pump in those two numbers, all three units will carry out calculations at the same time. But which one is going to be the output of this entire ALU? What do we need in this case? We have multiple input merged into one single output. It's a multiplexer. Very good. So when we have something like this, we'll use a multiplexer, which is a plexer. And it 
is a oops, plexer. We need a multiplexer with eight, uh, with four selection bits. Uh, two, excuse me, two selection bits. Even though we only use three of them, we'll leave the fourth one, you know, reserved. We can do other calculations later. Okay. Uh, we can specify the output, you know, well, we can do the enable thing, okay, so that's fine. So now we have to hook up, you know, the input or the output out of each calculation uh, mechanism to one of the inputs. So here's one. Oh, I forgot to change this to eight data bits. There we go. The second one goes to the second input here. And the third one goes to the third input here. The fourth one has nothing because I do not have another calculation unit. If I want to, you know, I, can, I suppose I can just add something to it. Just for the sake of the argument, I'm going to do a bitwise and, okay? So we go to gates, and then we specify a bitwise and, okay, like so. It, we only need, we will need eight bits, but only two inputs, like so. And we can make it a smaller design, make it a narrow one. And then the same thing, okay? The first number goes to the first input, and then the second number goes to the second input. And I'm just trying to find a way to do it. There we go. All right, so now we have the output of this guy going into the fourth input of the multiplexer. So you can basically see you know, how I can add exclusive bitwise, bitwise exclusive work bitwise not, bitwise or, so I can expand the number of calculations it can do, but I will have to make the multiplexer bigger as well, because now you know, the next one up is gonna have eight input and one out. Are we doing okay so far with this mechanism? We have the same two inputs feeding into all of the calculations, but we only pick the result of one as the output of the ALU. Yep. What did you do with the splitter? The splitter? The splitter, I have to do the splitter because the shifter, when you have only eight bits, three bits it would be enough to specify the maximum number of shifts, right? So that's why you know, the input into the shifter <coughs> only has three bits to specify how many bit positions to shift. But because the bus has eight bits, I have to split it into three and five and only feed the three into here. The other five I'm just ignoring as far as the bit shifter is concerned. Okay? All right. So now we specify the output of the ALU, you know, using a using output pins to represent it. So the output pin would also have eight data bits. Hook up directly to here. Okay. I'm almost done, not entirely yet. Okay. Because what I also need to do is to bring these wires into a two-bit input pin so that I can select which operation I want to perform. So that would be another input pin, two-bit wide, and we'll put it into here. This one selects you know, what operations I want to perform. This one is just output enable, okay? So for now, you know, since we are not really doing anything with other components, so for now, I'm just going to use a constant and basically say, yes, always drive the output, okay? So, which is not always gonna be, you know, it's, it's not always gonna make sense, but for now it does, okay? This is what I wanna do. All right, so this is the a very basic, simple ALU that can only perform, you know, four possible operations. If I want to expand it into eight operations, I can just keep adding more calculation units down here, but then I will also have to change the multiplexer to use a eight input, three selection pin type of multiplexer. But you can kind of see how this can scale up, right? You know, you can just stack on more stuff. Now let's take a look at you know, what, we, what, what we can do with this, okay? So let's say we want to do a subtraction, okay? I want to subtract three from 16, okay? So let's represent 16 first using the first number. But before we do that, let's double check and make sure which one is the number being subtracted. So if you hover over this, it shows you the number from which to subtract. We want this one to be 16. And then this one is the number to subtract from the uh, menu end. So this is the one that is at the bottom of a normal subtraction. 
Uh, 16 is, this is 1, 2, 4, 8, this is 16, so we have 1 16 here. And we want to subtract 3 from 16, so we have 1, 1 over here, okay? Oh, wait, the output seems to be wrong. This is not the difference between 16 and 3. This is the sum of uh, 16 and 3. But that makes sense because the selection bit which are these two, is selecting the first input to become the output as far as the multiplexer is concerned. So that means if, I am, if I'm only interested in the subtraction or the difference between these two numbers, I have to change this to what? Zero, one. Zero, one. Zero, one is correct. There you go. So now we are looking at one, one, zero, one, which is 13, okay? 16 minus three is 13. So now we have a subtraction operation. What if I want to perform a bitwise AND? Well, then we have to select 1, 1. But when you look at 16, bitwise AND 3, the end result should be all zeros. So this is basically how an ALU you know, operate. Yep? Uh, we have the CNC out, BNB out, all its constants. Uh, what happens with that one flag? We, we, we are simplifying the design by a great deal at this time. Yep. Um, basically, the, the actual carry flag, which we actually have to track, is its own register. So there's, there's something in the processor that can remember the carry or the borrow from the last addition or subtraction operation. But I'm, I'm simplifying it at this time you know, just so that we don't have to deal with you know, the complicated circuit related to that. Any other questions? Are there any questions about the ALU? Yep. So, uh, in the multiplexer, uh, if we're going to switch to the third input, what are we going to see? The shifted 13? Oh, what do you think? Well, if it shifts to the right by one bit, right? No. How many bits are we shifting? Two. No. Three. <laughs> you can keep going up, right? Well, what is one one? Three, three. One is three. One one is three. So we are shifting by three positions. Okay. The input is one zero 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 as a binary number. What happens when you right shift three positions? What do you get? One zero. Well, the most significant bits being all zeros, but the least significant two bits would be one zero. Let's check that. Right. Okay. One zero. Is the output? Yep. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Oh, but you have to kind of work with this, okay? You got to figure out what it's going to do, and then do it, and then compare, you know, the result of the simulation to what you think should be the output. Okay. That's very important. You know, it, running the simulation and just you know, go like, oh, okay, I see it works. You know, is one thing, but you know, the way you want to study for this class is to challenge yourself and go like, okay, I wonder what this is gonna do. And then work it out first in your mind, okay? And then only use the simulator to verify that your understanding is correct. Are there any questions about the ALU? Okay, that looks kind of complicated. Do I want to use this, you know, in the actual processor design? Probably not, because you know, if I use this in the actual processor design, it's going to take up a lot of space. So the typical trick that we do, we have done this many times already, is to right click and just say, okay, let's specify the appearance, okay? This is the appearance at this time. Uh, you can change the uh, position of the pins. These two are the inputs. This is the selection. This is the output, okay? But you know, this is not a typical way to draw an ALU. An ALU is typically drawn like this. It, it's drawn like a Y shape for the most part. You know, it's, it has two inputs. In it. I wonder if there's a quicker way to do this. Nope. <laughs> well, maybe this will do. Oh yeah, this will do it. Some of you are better artists than I am. It looks like a t-shirt, but that's how an ALU usually looks like. It's a t-shirt. 
and then you can move the pins so you can move one of the input pins now this is the nice fe nice feature in case you have not noticed is when you take when you click on one pin in the design view of a component it will actually give you a mini picture of the overall design and highlight the one that you're actually dealing with because that makes it easier for you to kind of pinpoint okay what is this pin well it's that pin okay um, I just graded the subtractor homework assignment last night and several people um, turn the four bit subtractor into a single block itself but in doing so labeled the pins incorrectly okay but since it's one extra step I did not ask for and when I looked into the actual four bit subtractor it worked okay so I did not deduct any points but that obviously is the result of looking at all the pins and not remember which pin is actually which pin in the underlying design. This is going to be helpful for that sort of thing. So what I'll do is I'm going to drag this one over here. Oh, it can only go to uh, one of those positions. Yeah. Why did they draw it that way? Hmm? Why is the ALU drawn like a t-shirt? Uh, because it's kind of uh, doing the same, this thing. You know, it has two inputs and one output. This is called the uh, orientation pin, and you know, this one is can be done. You know, at just a particular corner. This is the out output, and this is the selection. The selection typically would go onto the side. So I have to redo this one a little bit here. Okay, you guys can make this look pretty. I'm pretty bad at looking, making things look pretty. There we go. Okay, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you suck. <laughs> yes, I do. I definitely do. I would, I would totally fail in art class. So typically with an ALU, it looks like this. The two top part, you know, represents the input. The bottom part represents the output. And then the selection comes from the side, basically say, okay, what am I supposed to do? Am I adding this time? Am I subtracting this time? What am I supposed to do, okay? And this is one single ALU, okay? So let me just kind of go back to the actual design, you know, because most of you don't want to look at this too long, right? I mean, this looks, <laughs> this really looks ugly. <coughs> Does your does your microprocessor look have that ALU feature? <coughs> it has that ALU feature already, but it doesn't quite do the bitwise and the bitwise or no, the T-shirt. Um, no, I I only have it represented as a as a rectangle because I know my limitations. <laughs> Dirty Harry said, "Man has got to know his limitations." <laughs> right? I can't quite imitate the part where he can, but chew on a. What does he put in his mouth? Toothpick or a straw? Toothpick. That's it. That's it. A toothpick. So I cannot really quite imitate that part you know, with a toothpick in my mouth and just kind of mumble. All right. So getting back to the actual design itself, this is one ALU, and the Intel processor we kind of looked up last time, it has multiple ALUs per core. So if it has, let's say it has three integer you know, cores, or integer ALUs, which means you know, it can perform integer arithmetics. If, if it has three per core and you have a four core processor, that means it has 12 integer ALUs within the, on the die, which also means it can carry on 12 integer arith arithmetic operations in parallel at the same time. That's how the processor can keep up with <clears throat> the processing with the instructions is it can perform multiple operations at the same time. So even if you, if, even if certain process, even if certain instructions take a while to get in and get processed, something can always go on at a certain time, and that's why you know you can have you can achieve close to three billion of instructions <coughs> executed per second when you have a three uh, gigahertz clock. Is that making any sense? Are there any questions about this picture? Any other questions? Now, in a normal design, you know, this pin here, would, this would be a pin too. In other words, this is going to be an interface for the outside to communicate to the ALU and say, 
should you drive the output pin or not? Because the output of the ALU, where do you think it connects to? How do we, where do we store the result of a calculation? Into memory, okay, so that's one place to go. What, do you, do you, can, can you think of another place where we want to store the result of a calculation? Remember the analogy. Storing into RAM is to go from this room carrying a single piece of paper with a result to the library, second floor. Okay? So most of the time you don't want to run all the way to the library. Where do you want to go? Register, exactly. So, so the output of this, okay, if you look at the really ugly picture, again, <laughs> this output here usually has a path, one path to go to memory and one path to go to the register bank. Not going to a single register, but a register bank, okay? Because in a processor, we typically have multiple registers and you have to be able to select which register is going to store the result of this calculation. And that's going to be the focus. Well, actually, we can get started on the register bank today. Okay, we'll finish it on Thursday. Yep. Could you go back to the uh, alternate design and then highlight your splitter? The splitter, <coughs> which is here. Yeah. Yep. So I select the three the, f the least significant three bits to the right, which is this one here, and then the rest to the left, which is which is ignored. So they don't even get into the shifter. Okay, so you changed that after you changed your fan out to two? No, right. I did not change the fan out. I only changed the bit width. I changed the bit width to eight from two. By default, it was two. Okay, so when you changed it to eight, should it have been four and four? Instead no. Of three and five? No. Well, that be the fan out. Yeah, so I'm glad. But the fan out is just saying, you know, how many output bundles do we get out of the splitter? But it doesn't necessarily say, okay, you know, half and half. Okay. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, it was half and half. Remember, you know, it had the first four, four wires from zero to three onto the first bundle, and then from four to seven, the second the other four wires into the second bundle. And all you did was change the right. bit. Okay. Yep. Just so that you know the first bundle, you know, has the right width going into the shifter. Yep. Oh, I still don't understand the shifter uh, operator. The shift operation? Yeah. The second number okay, the first number is the one being shifted. Okay, this is the one that has all the bits being shuffled. This one specified how many positions are we shifting? So one one is three, so that means we are shifting to the right hand side by three bits. If you want you know left shift to be done quickly, you can also use a left shifter. So most ALUs have more components than we have here. Okay, so I'll just actually I'll, I'll just go ahead and expand on that one. So most you know ALUs would have you know at least you know, three input bits, you know, and they will have more operations that you can specify. For instance. In terms of gates, okay, so normally you also want to do a bitwise OR gate here. You also want to do a bitwise NOT gate. So we select uh, bitwise NOT. You also want to do a bitwise exclusive OR sometimes, okay, not all the time. And then with uh, arithmetic operations, um, most modern processors can also do multiplier in, in the hardware and also a divider in the hardware. So that's why you know this is a way simplified design you know, the way it is, but I just want to illustrate the concept of an ALU. Okay. A multiplier is a, actually a pretty com a divider and multipliers are complex designs. So when you are when you're dealing with a design that you want to be low cost, a lot of times they don't have a hardware multiplier, which means all multiplication must be done in <coughs> software. So think about what you do normally in multiplication. You have to do it in software instead of doing it in hardware. It will take more time. We have about five, well, not five. We have quite a few minutes left. Let's, let's try to do multiplication, see if you guys know how to do multiplication in base two. This is boring because you already know it. OK, how many people remember how to do multiplication in base 10? 
Where's my calculator? Where's my TI? Right? You know, I cannot do multiplication without my TI. Okay, let's 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 check whether you can do it. Okay, 713 times I don't know. Let's pick something easy. 65. Okay, that looks pretty easy to me. Okay, so I know the way I write this may not be the same as how you were taught because you know I was taught in Hong Kong here, so the arrangement would be different, but it will still be doing the same thing. Okay, so I was taught to do the six times three here. Okay, and it has a carry of one. Six times one plus one is seven with no carry to the next one. Six times seven is 42, so we have 42 over here. And then we plus the following. This will be three, five times three, which is 15 with a carry to this one. Five times one is five plus one is six. And then this is five times seven, which is 35. And then we add these two numbers. Uh, 0 plus 5 is 5, that's 4 with a carry, that's 3 with a carry, this is 6, and this is 4, like so. Okay, so I know, you know this is not typically how you guys write it, because I think most people work from the least significant part first, okay? But that's okay, it's the same idea, okay? Same idea. Do you see a shift operation here? In base 10, not in base 2. Yes, there is one. <laughs> the first row. This row here. 6 times 713 is 4278. The zero is introduced because of a shift. Okay, Because we are multiplying something by 10. In base 10, shifting to the left means multiply by 10. Does that make sense? Okay. <coughs> Let's do something in base 2 then. Okay, we'll start with something easy. 11011, one, one, one. that, okay? Times 1101, one, one. okay? How do you think we deal with this multiplication? If I use the same thing, I'm going to use, I will deal with the most significant bit first, or the most significant bit, the most significant portion first. So I will put three zeros here, and then what do I put on the left hand side? Row. The first row. Um, do we have to deal with multiplication? Well, in theory, it is a multiplication, but it's a trivial multiplication. Why do you think this is a trivial multiplication? It's by one. By one. Oh, great! Right. One one zero zero one. Cool. I'm done with the first row. Uh, what about the second row here? What do we put here? Like that, right? Because the, the, the second row deals with the second most significant bit of the second number that we're multiplying. Is that making any sense? Yes. What about the third row? Zeros. Well, yeah, yeah it's going to be all zeros, so that means we only have one left. But since I have only introduced how to do addition two rows at a time, let's do this first. Okay, so we'll do addition here. So we have. 0 plus 0 is 0. 0 plus 0 is 0. This is a 1. This is a 1. This is a 0. This is a 1. This is a 0 with a carry of 1. 1 plus 1 is a 0 with a carry of 1. Now we deal with this number, but there's nothing to write because 0 times anything is 0. So we only have 1 of this left with no shifting, right? So we deal with that one, which is 11001. We add these two numbers together. And what do we get? A 1 here, a 0 here. Oops. A 1 here, a 0 here, a 0 here, a 0 here, a 1 here, a 0 here, and a 1 here. OK, but tack, you just throw, you know, you just threw a whole bunch of zeros and ones on the screen. Nobody knows whether you're correct or not. Well, let's check it. <laughs> right? You don't trust me. You don't want to trust me. I don't intentionally lie, okay? But sometimes I do the calculations incorrectly. Where's my calculator? I don't have a calculator. Where's my TI? <laughs> hmm? 
No, 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 no. Let, let me show you how I do calculators here using the command line, okay? It's called BC. Oh, I don't even have that installed. Fine. I cannot imagine I forgot to install BC. Okay, so BC is now installed. Excellent. This is BC. Does that look like a calculator to you? No. Yes, it is a calculator. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll do the base conversion and the multiplication all in one swoop, okay? So we'll say the first number is uh, one, plus no two, no four, that's an eight, and there's a 16. The second number has a one, no two, one four, one eight, okay? So the end result is 325. How do we know this number is 325 down there? We have one, one, no two, one four, and then we have no eight, no 16, no 32, 164, no 128, and one 256. That's 325 too. So I just did the verification using BC, which has no innate ability to do base conversion. This is what you should be able to do, okay? You know, this is not, maybe not as quickly, you know, because you, know, you cannot count the bits as quickly, but that's the way to do it, okay? Because you're just counting, do I have one or zero of each power of two? And just add the numbers, right? So this is a good verification, um, but it, it's not a 100% reassurance that I did carry out the calculation correctly. Because all it verified was this number times this number ends up with this number. But the steps in between can still, can still have problems. Because if you have two errors that can mask each other out, then it won't show up in the process. Okay? And I'm pretty sure some of you, not all, but some of you, might have seen you know, masking you know, in your programs in CISB 360, where one particular problem, one flaw of your program is masking something else, so it doesn't show up as a problem. Okay, so I'm just showing you something that looks reasonably correct, but you know, in order to verify all the steps, you really have to carry on you know, the individual step and double check everything. Are we doing okay so far with this? So this is what software has to do when multiplier is too expensive to implement in silicon, so it's not on die, okay? What kind of processor do you think will not have a multiplier? Remember the 40 cents processor that we talked about? No? Oh, yeah, yes? yeah, yeah. Yeah, that one, that one does not have a hardware multiplier. Now, the same series of chips, okay, but more expensive, you know, the ones that cost about four or five dollars, those do have a hardware multiplier so they can carry on integer multiplication a lot faster. Okay. All right, so we are running out of time in the classroom. So you, can, you guys can work on your homework assignment in the lab and I can take a look if you want me to take a look. And uh, that's it for today.